गुड मॉर्निंग खुशामदीद आदाब सत श्री अकाल नमस्कार वेलकम टू द चैनल माई नेम इज कुबेर वी हैवेंट डन दिस फॉर अ कपल ऑफ वीक्स एंड आई अपॉलोजाइज फॉर दैट वन बिकॉज आई वॉज ऑन ऑन लीव एंड एंड देर फॉर द इंटरनेट कनेक्शन डेंट अलाउ वी ट्राइड इट वन इट वॉज नॉट द बेस्ट uh and the second time because i was not feeling very well even today i've got a very severe back ache so i will try to do this for as long as i can sit straight and hold my back and uh therefore hopefully we can get in as many questions as i can obviously today i did want to talk about a few things because they have been on the horizon for some time uh expectancy draws are not happening so disclaimer if you are watching this video only to know about express entry draws i do not have any update i do not have any news i do not have any reasons why ircc is not conducting the draws of course we will speculate of course as usual i love doing that we will we will try to understand what's going on we will try to understand some numbers some data but if you're watching this video only because you want to know what's going on with uh, ircc i don't know uh, i wish they would let us know or they give us a sneak peek into their plans they don't they they hold their cards quite close to their chest and, and therefore we don't really understand what is going on uh similarly another subject which has been really uh, i wouldn't say bothering me because personally it does not really uh, impact me directly but overall there has been quite a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about the housing crisis in canada and how international students are the direct result and there should be a cap etc etc well there has been a mixed reaction obviously a lot of people are not blaming me pointing finger not blaming me but pointing fingers at me and saying that uh, you know uh, why uh, that i am um, pandering and and i'm uh, trying to unnecessarily create or play both sides of the game and because this is my business market but well, to be very honest students is not my business market i i do not do business within the international student uh, business i mean within that market uh, but blaming the international students for the housing crisis uh, that doesn't sit very well for and, and oh, bear with me hold on uh, i understand that when the numbers of international students increase obviously there will be a demand for the housing and therefore the housing you know a so called crisis but that's not how you should be looking at it canada canadian government has been allowing not only the international student but several other people into canada as well and this is a collective demand for housing uh year on year we have increased the immigration targets uh year on year you have increased the international student target year on year you have brought on new public policies which has further put a huge huge pressure on the on the economy in terms of providing the housing so why just single out the international students okay fair enough last year there was about 500 600000 international students who were approved this year it is about 900000 but look at the policies the government has made so before you take out your gun and start shooting the international students and say you know these are the people who are responsible just hold your horses just just look at it in a have a more pra pragmatic approach to it have a more holistic approach to it have a more complete perspective of it right so just to just to talk talk few numbers okay international students they have approved about 900000 new international students to canada okay fair enough uh, so you want to blame them but what about the fact that you came out with the public policy because you wanted the foreign workers in canada to hold you know to stay put and therefore you extended post graduate work permit once twice thrice three times right uh, you did that then you changed the the requirement for international students now basically with the english language english language requirements even slightly lower uh, ielts bands overall would also be accepted for for the sts stream well you did that not only that you also included other english language tests so that it becomes easier for the international students to apply well if it is such a big problem with the international students why are you trying to do this another another one you further made it easier this is when i'm saying you i'm talking about canada and the canadian government and rcc you further made it easier for the spouses of the international students uh, and the foreign workers to come to canada so what i'm talking about is that this is not for international student but basically the foreign workers so if you're a foreign worker in canada earlier you had to be working in noc 0 ab noc 0 ab jobs before you could have your spouse join you on an op with an open work permit you remove that condition you remove that requirement you basically said anybody who is a foreign worker in canada as long as you're working your spouse can can join you you they can get an open work permit so you allowed more more uh, uh, people to come into canada then obviously the temporary residence visas well we know there are a lot of uh, visas that get refused 
but you also do approve tons and tons and tons of visit visas. Lately, you can go on Instagram, go on uh, TikTok. It's, it's a common video everybody wants to make. Come to Canada on a visit visa, convert it into a work permit. Come to Canada on a visit visa, convert it into a study permit. I mean, so you are, there is some sort of a promotion going on which says that, you know, come to Canada on a visit visa and then therefore you'll be able to get into a work permit, blah, blah, blah. So you have increased, you've seen increasing number of, of people who are coming on visit visa who are primarily not coming to visit Canada for a few uh, days, weeks, but are now looking to stay put here for, for, for X number of days. Then, hold on, I, I'm not done. Then uh, let's talk about Ukrainians. I mean, nobody wants to be in a war situation, of course, and, and I'm absolute, you know, uh, sympathy and, and all my heart goes out to whatever is happening over there. But we're talking about the numbers here. So let's, let's you know, let's let's stay practical. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, the, the human uh, emotional uh, thing about you know who you allow who you do not allow but purely on the numbers more than 1 million ukrainians applied for visas to canada okay approximately 800000 plus I, I think it it is now closer to closer to 900000 probably million now have been approved uh, i do not know the exact numbers who have already arrived in canada but if so many have been approved you will see a, a lot of them coming into canada anyways at the last count almost about 400 to 500000 were already in canada uh Hong Kong, uh, when the problems were happening in Hong Kong, of course, a lot of people from Hong Kong were allowed to come into Canada. They were allowed to ob obtain work permits. They were allowed to obtain a permanent resident pathway. Those numbers also got added. Uh, we have uh, people who were uh, running away from war and persecution. Persecution in, in Afghanistan, you had 40,000 of those people coming in. Not only that, you have an ongoing influx of refugees, you have an ongoing influx uh, of, of people who are seeking asylum, who are seeking uh, protection. Those numbers also keep coming up, right? If you count the number of people that you have now, and of course, there was a recent report which said that uh, the way IRCC is counting its numbers or the way ESDC is counting its numbers, Stats Canada is counting its number, it's way off by almost 1 million. So when they did their population census counting, counting, they forgot or somehow they managed to mess it up that they counted more than 1 million people less, which basically means Canada's population is not, not 40 million, but more than 40 million, probably 41 and I would say close to 42, if, if you want to count it in that manner. So with that, with all these big, big numbers that are in looming in the, on the horizon, you still want to target only the international students. So I am not saying that the international students and the, you know, the, the large increasing numbers are not directly uh, contributing to this. But why target only them? That's what my problem. My, my problem is not with the understanding of the numbers. My problem is, is why target only one specific? The reason why... Uh, uh, and they obviously there is a talk that they want to cap the international students. They do not want, uh, you know, they, they want to restrict the number of international students. Do you think that's really going to happen? It's a $26 billion industry. The education institutions in Canada over here are getting direct benefit from the international students coming into Canada. Mind you, international students in coming into Canada also feed the labor market. Uh, right now, the, the basic entry-level jobs, majority, majority of them are being done by the international students who are either working part-time or in a lot of cases, as you and I know, working cash jobs or working more than the 20 hours that they're allowed to work. In addition to that, because international students are here, they obviously also feed the economy. They are bringing money. At the end of the day, they're coming here. Uh, they are working here. They're doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do. Uh, they're obviously paying the taxes while they're working. Of course, if they're making money, they have to pay the taxes as well. They are also by in all different ways feeding the economy. How can you, you know, ignore that factor as well? You remove this one 900,000 plus people. You remove these 1 million people away and see how badly the, the, the economy gets impacted. The colleges, the institutions, the universities are making more money out of the international students that they can ever make from the domestic students. On the contrary, if, if you have read the reports, Ontario, which also is supposed to provide funding to the colleges and, and universities, actually scaled back on the amount of funding that they provide because the international students were coming and they were paying for all the amount of money that the colleges and universities needed. Ontario didn't have to fund them. Or actually the funding amount was reduced drastically. So with all that and the governments being aware and the provincial governments and the federal government being aware, you really think they're going to do anything about it. So at the end of the day, why bring out all this hatred? Why bring out all this negativity only towards one community? Why? Because 
uh, you see the headlines and that is what happens. That was another thing. Uh, so yeah, these are the things that we're going to talk about today, but not about the international students by and large, but I wanted to sort of clear the air because you tend to hear this time and time again and, and people keep saying the same things again and again. So that was one thing that people should be aware of. Uh, let's get talking. Of course, we are going to talk about Express Entry, what the numbers are looking like, what some other TikTokers and Instagram and YouTube videos are saying and how misleading those uh, comments and information are. But let's start with our presentation, shortly talk about the uh, PNP draws and then move from there on. Okay. Starting with the quote of the week, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. It's a Chinese proverb. And, and it's so true, right? Every time we're thinking, oh, I should have done it five years earlier. I should have come to Canada five years earlier. I should have uh, made my express entry profile two years back when the scores were low. I should have uh, done it three years back, whatever, right? You, you always have these reminiscing thoughts. I should have done it then. I should have done it this time. Well, the point is, what are you doing now? That is what matters. Always live in today. Don't live in yesterday because it's not going to help you. Whatever has happened has happened. As I say, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years back uh, because then by now you would have seen the fruits of that of your labor. But if you didn't do it, do it then, at least do it today. At least get it done now so that five years down, 10 years down, 20 years down, you will at least be happy that you did plant this tree today. So the whole point being, uh, don't just think of what you could have done. Think of what you can do as of now. And that's what's going to matter uh, in the long run. This is the Canadian Immigration Weekly Roundup. Stay up to date with us on the immigration news and trends, starting with the PNP draws. Quite a few happened there. Uh, September 7th, Ontario invited 300 candidates through the French uh, speaker stream, there, uh, which is linked to the express entry. They invited the CRS score between 308 and 434. Uh, I'm assuming they stuck with 434 because of the last express entry draw with the French speakers. That was a category based draw. So they stuck with 308 to 434. Uh, but you can see, right, how the scores, if you were a francophone, I mean, the scores are coming right down to 308. What else could you ask for? What other motivation would you want? What other, you know, nudge in your in your ribs would you want to sort of get get going and at least uh, get French as your second language so then you can give yourself an opportunity. Uh, it was a general draw, meaning the candidates could be invited from any occupation. So this time it was not a category specific draw. Otherwise, uh, Ontario is known to conduct category draws uh, even with the French speaker stream. But this time it was a general draw and they went right down to 308, which is, which is a great draw to have done. British Columbia on the 6th of September invited 222 candidates through the three draws of BCPNP. Uh, 160 were invited in a general draw for skilled workers. Uh, and then they all, the, when they invited the skilled workers, international graduates and, and entry level uh, semi-skilled candidates, the requirement of scores was between 89 and 110. Of course, they also have continued to invite the early childhood educators and health workers with a required, 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 required score of 60. Uh, New Brunswick, the province result, released the results of their draw and they invited 259 candidates in a draw which was conducted in July. Obviously, it's a late in, in news that came out. The invitations were divided among the New Brunswick PNP. There were 58 candidates in the New Brunswick Employment Connection, 130 through the Student Connection and 71 through the New Brunswick Occupations in Demand Connection. Now let's talk a little bit about this particular province. New Brunswick, it's a great province in terms of the PNP programs. And uh, if you are currently in Ontario, if you are currently in uh, British Columbia, if you're currently in any of the provinces, you're struggling with the PNP program. You're still not able to figure out my, my work permit is expiring. What do I do? Which way do I go? Uh, obviously, Atlantic provinces are touted to be the, the best at this point of time given the circumstances in, in order for you to be able to find a solution. Why? A couple of reasons. One, you will always have the option through the PNP draw. So the local PNP, for example, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Islands, Newfoundland and Labrador. Plus, you will also have an opportunity through the AIP, Atl AIP Atlantic Immigration Program. Yes, the catch is and will be that you have to find an employer support. Now, I know it's, it's easier said than done, but hey, this has been there on, I mean, this has been a requirement for quite some time. 
So if you didn't know this already, then I'm not sure what you were thinking. Uh, for any PNP, now if you are choosing to change the province wherever you are, for any PNP that you go to, you will need the employer support. Okay, You will need a job offer that will help you get through the program. So the sooner you understand that, the sooner be the better it is. Of course, if you get to, to the Atlantic provinces, including the New Brunswick, then finding an employer who can give you a job offer, thereby applying through the uh, employment connection stream is a good idea. Now, for people who are still preparing to study in Canada, if you're outside Canada, if you're preparing to study in Canada, or if you're in Canada and you're looking to do your second program, New Brunswick is a great option. They have the student connection stream whereby if you already have one year of work experience, you can create your express entry profile. You come to New Brunswick, you complete a study program, eligible study program, could be one year program, could be your master's, could be whatever. After you have completed your program, you would be eligible to apply for the uh, student connection stream. Very plain, simple, straightforward, nothing technical there. You go onto their account, you create your expression of interest, you got you get an ITA automatically and you go ahead and apply. A great program, as I said. Yeah, there are a few conditions. You don't need a job offer. You just need to have completed the program through the eligible institution. That is the only requirement. And, and of course, you should having a, you should be having an express entry, valid express entry profile. Great program, as I'm saying. Uh, so if you're still thinking which and where and what, then probably take a look at New Brunswick. Alberta. Uh, on the 29th of August, now obviously it's, it's an old draw and we're talking about 29th of August because they don't publish the information immediately, but they invited 18 candidates through the dedicated healthcare pathway with Alberta job offer where you required a CRS score of 300. And August was a busy month for Alberta Advantage Immigration Programs, which what they refer to as AAIP. And they held eight separate draws and invited a total of 883 candidates. Now, again, Alberta has been a favorite for a lot of people. And it is also a ray of hope for a lot of other people whose scores are low, whose occupations are not considered as in demand in Ontario or Saskatchewan. And they are hoping that Alberta may invite them. But the problem with Alberta is that they never really announce any criteria. They never publish the information under which they are inviting the people, except for very broad uh, industry uh, highlight. Therefore, you don't really know who gets invited. Uh, yes, if you have an LMI, you have a job offer in Alberta, then you have a bit of an advantage. You may get selected or you may get invited. No guarantee. You may get invited. There is no guarantee, mind you. Number two is that if you have siblings, parents in Alberta, uh, and if your occupation, primary occupation is in demand or considered as in demand, of course, there is no list that you can refer to. But again, if it is considered as in demand, then again, you will have a preference and you may get invited. Uh, other than that, if you ever get invited by Alberta, consider yourself extremely lucky. Probably go and also buy a lotto ticket because there is also a good option that you might be uh, winning that one as well. But Alberta, great province. Only keep in mind that uh, you should always, always be very careful when you are working with Alberta PNB. What, I, what I'm trying to say is that, for example, uh, in any other province, Saskatchewan, Ontario, British Columbia, any of the Atlantic provinces, once you receive the nomination and for whatever reason, your express entry profile becomes invalid or even your express entry profile after you have submitted your PR application, let's say your application gets rejected because let's say you did not submit the correct PCC, let's say your West report was uh, uh, expired or whatever the reason might be, your express entry application gets rejected, R10 stage, okay? You can go back to the province within the nomination validity because the nomination validity is for six months, right? So you will go back to the province and you request them, please give me the nomination again. I've created my new profile. This was the reason. Please, please. And in most cases, the provinces will give you the nomination again. And in some cases, they may even extend your nomination period beyond six months, give you another six months so that you can take advantage of the nomination which you've already received. But not with Alberta. Alberta does not do it. So therefore, if you are working with Alberta, you have received your ITA. And you have to be very, very careful with your express entry profile. Absolutely treat it like, like an extremely fragile uh, item. You, can, you cannot let go anything wrong with your uh, express entry application. Because if your express entry profile, profile becomes ineligible during the process of your application, or if your express entry application gets rejected, then you probably have also lost your uh, nomination from Alberta. You will have to start from the scratch. So this is one thing that you have to be very, very mindful with Alberta and be very careful when you're working with them. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Arima draw. Okay, this also happened. Uh, 
Quebec released the results of a draw that occurred or that was held on August of 24. The province invited 1,000 candidates from a wide range of targeted occupation. They required a minimum score of 584, which is quite high. The eligible candidates required also required a seven oral proficiency in French and they were required to have a job offer outside of Montreal. I'm not sure what else they will require. They will also probably require that you have a unicorn as a pet and they will require you to have a mansion on top of Mount Everest. Probably something of that, right? I mean, all these requirements they put. So the score is 584. You have to have a seven level uh, proficiency in French. You also have to have a job offer outside Mont Montreal and then you get invited. Wow. And still there were thousands of such candidates. So you guys are awesome, you know. Good way to go. Congratulations. In other news, that's where we get to the very exciting part of today's uh, uh, presentation. Now, let's talk about Express Entry first because I know a lot of you are here because you want to talk about that. Okay, you want to hear what's going on with the Express Entry. So I'm sorry, but the, the presentation is a bit skewed, but let's let's see. It. Till date, as of right now, IRCC has issued 77,748 ITAs in Express Entry. In 2023, okay. In August, 8,600, which is a bit lower. July, 9,600. June, 9,600. May, 5,389. April, 7,000. In March, bumper, 21,667. Why? Because there was one draw of PNP, 667, and then there were three draws, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. Therefore, bringing a total tally of 21,667. February, there were uh, only 4,892. January, there was also 11,000, but then also keep in mind, previous year, December, there was no draw. So after the November, then the next draw was happening in January. So in January, they did they, they conducted two back-to-back -back draws, uh, 5,500 each. So 77,748 invitations issued. Actually, it's a big number. It, it's, it's not a small number by any standards. My estimate for this year was roughly 80 to 85,000 invitations. They've already issued 77,748. Now, I know I've seen a lot of TikTok videos and that tells you how much TikTok I watch, right? And I've seen just this morning and it got me a bit worked up. Uh, a consultant um, and somebody else. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of people who now have made Canadian immigration their area of expertise. So they, they'd like to talk with a lot of you know authority on the subject. They were talking about the quotas and they said that 77,748 invitations have been issued and the quota for this year is 82,880. I do not know where they got that from because if they were referring to the FHS, Federal High Skilled uh, Category Quota, then that is not the quota for ITAs. That is the quota for the number of people who will come to Canada <laughs> under those economic programs, Federal High, federal high Skilled Program. But obviously these consultants, these, these so-called experts do not understand even the basic difference between an ITA and the quotas but you my audience is is not those tiktokers obviously you understand better you you obviously have a better uh, uh, you access to the information that i'm talking about because you watch this video right okay itas are invitations to apply in express entry fhs federal high skilled are the categories that are indicated for invitation in express entry right the quotas let me see if i have that here yes of course i have it so this is the 2023 immigration level plan from IRCC. Now, if you see federal high skill, number one, where it says number one, right? That is 82,880. Now, always, always, always the immigration levels plan is for the number of people, not for the ITAs. Please do not confuse these two things. It's always creating a big confusion. Now, why is it different and how is it different? Let me just go back to this slide. Now, when IRCC invites, let's say IRCC in the month of August sent out 10,000 invitations. Okay. Now, if you are part of our Facebook group, if you're part of our, our YouTube channel, then obviously you also understand as and how we have spoken about so many express entry draws that a lot of people like to decline their ideas. Why do they decline their ideas? They decline their ideas for n number of reasons. Uh, sometimes they are afraid that they haven't completed the period of work. Uh, they are complete. They're, they're probably are going to be seen as committing misrepresentation. They're too scared. Their friends and their relatives have told them, don't do it, don't do it. They decline their idea because they got their points earlier. You know that. That happens, right? IRCC, oh, sorry, Express Entry gives you points for work experience one month earlier. Why? Because it's a system glitch, because it calculates month, month, year, year. It calculates from the first of the month to the first of the month, and hence it gives you points earlier. But that is not a reason to decline. You should still continue with your ITA. You should submit your documentation only after completing a valid period of work. But 
people decline. People don't understand that they still decline. Not only there, not only people. It's a lot of lawyers and consultants who also mislead their clients by saying, "No, no, no, please decline because you shouldn't have received this idea." Anyways, another reason is people don't receive their police clearances on time. They get afraid. They they think they have to. If they don't have the police clearance, they cannot apply. Therefore, they decline, hoping to get another ID. Uh, they do not have the proper work experience documents. They decline. They haven't entered the information in their express entry, and they are afraid that you know this will be a mismatch. So they decline. A lot of people decline. Trust me. Uh, as much as you would not want to believe it, I know of a lot of. I know of one person who declined thirty times. You know, can you imagine thirty times? I mean, at one point of time, by the time he consulted with me, he had already declined 29 times. And I was like, why are you doing this, my friend? Just because he was sitting at a 500 plus score, something was not working very well with his profile and he continued to decline an idea. Uh, so you can imagine more than a year, he continued to decline an idea. Anyways, so in addition to the people who decline their ideas, there are also people whose applications get rejected. Rejected means the R10 stage. The first stage of your express entry application is the R10. R10 is the stage where IRCC officer has received your application. They have gone through your documents, but they are not assessing your documents. They're only checking if the application is complete. It's like you submitting your paper application on the first counter. In the first counter, they says to you, do you have your passport? Do you have your photographs? Do you have your police clearance? Do you have your employment documents? Do you have your um, uh, education documents? Yes, file is complete, art and passed. But no, your police clearance is not correct. You are supposed to provide from Australia your driving history. You did not provide it. Application rejected. A lot of people applications get rejected. Okay, their police clearance does not cover your entire duration of your stay. Application rejected. Your WES report is not meant for IRCC, but you did a course by course. Application gets rejected. Your IELTS have expired. Application gets rejected. Your WES or your ECA is expired. Application gets rejected. So there are plenty of reasons for the applications getting rejected. We count rather. There's an estimate. And again, this estimate is entirely based on the open data source that is available on the IRCC website from the data that IRCC made public from 2018 to 2020. About 32 to 33% of the ITAs that are issued are either declined, rejected, or refused. Now, refused is much later when your application has been assessed, your documents are being checked, you did not provide proof of funds properly, or you were supposed to, you did not provide it all. Your reference letter, you chose the wrong NOC code. Uh, your police clearance again is a mess. Uh, your uh, you committed this representation. You provided fraudulent documents. A lot of people do it. I mean, as much as we are quite surprised by people doing it. Any of those reasons, your application gets refused. So the total percentage of the ideas that is being issued, we consider roughly 32 to 33 percent as people whose ideas get refused, rejected, declined. So you can imagine out of 77,748, about 30, 30, let's let's take around figure. 30 percent would have been declined, refused, rejected. So basically, RCC will issue additional ITAs to come back to the number. Now, each ITA also does not mean it is for one person. Each ITA means it could be for multiple people. Multiple people means in one application, for example, you are creating your express entry profile, you are married. So now you are one ITA, but two people. You have children. You, If you have one child, uh, you have you become one ITA, three people. You have two children, one ITA, four people. You get the gist, right? Uh, I've seen an application where they had eight children. So, mashallah, <laughs> good luck to them. God bless them. So a family of 10. So you can imagine how, how the numbers can, can vary. The quotas, FHS quotas, is only for the number of people, not for the number of ITAs. Again, your TikTokers will, will confuse you by saying that the, there is a remaining quota of 5,000 ITAs to be issued. No, there is no such thing as 5,000 ITAs to be issued. Rather, the quota for this year, 2023, which is 82,880. Let me see this one here. 82,880, the quota for 2023 has already been achieved. That number has already been taken care of. Until June this year, more than 200 and some 40,000 people had already become permanent residents against all different categories and classes. Uh, but under federal high skill, I can assure you 82,880, that quota has already been achieved. Right now, whatever ITAs are being issued by IRCC, that is all against the quotas for next year. Why? Because 
If they issue an ITA today, you will take 60 days or any time between that to complete your application. They will take three to six months to process your application. Then they will give you a period of time where you can come to Canada. And therefore, by the time you come to Canada would be sometimes next year, middle of next year. Therefore, you will be then accorded the quota of next year. It's basic mathematics, common sense, nothing, nothing technical over here. It's not rocket science. But obviously, some TikTokers would rather have you believe differently. Therefore, you intelligent audience that I have, you now understand the difference. Also, in the ITAs, you have to consider that there is provincial nominee programs who are linked to express entry. So that is also going to be uh, given as ITAs. So that number, again, that number has not been identified. What the number has been identified is this. 105 500 that is the provincial nominee program but not all pnp programs are express entry based rather there is a big proportion of the uh, pnp programs that are not linked to express entry for example in ontario the phd stream the master stream the employer job offer stream the international student stream the entrepreneur stream all of these are not linked to express entry these are all non express entry similarly saskatchewan oid stream not linked to express entry saskatchewan hard to find skills pilot not linked to express entry alberta alberta opportunity stream not linked to express entry uh, british columbia pnp uh, semi skilled uh, uh, stream not linked to express entry similarly in in the aip uh, but aip is not even part of this uh, similarly, in the PNPs in the British Columbia, uh, sorry, in the Atlantic provinces, there are a lot of streams which are not linked to express entry. So therefore, the number of quotas that you have for 2023 for provincial nominee program, which is linked to express entry, in my opinion, would be about 40 to 45,000, no more than that, right? Uh, because of the number of streams that are linked, which will basically give you a number here. In my calculation, in my expectation, assumption, prediction, speculation, whatever you want to call it, roughly I've said 35 to 40,000 are PNP linked. So therefore, it tells you the number of people, not ITAs, people for 2023 under express entry. Express entry, which is federal high skill plus PNPs that are linked to express entry would be in a range of about 125,000 people. 125,000 people. Now, how many ITAs would that be, you would ask, right? Now, if one ITA could be multiple people, and we do not know how many people, again, you will go back to the IRCC's website. You will check the open data sources. You will see how many people came, how many ITAs were issued. You will come to an average number. We calculate one successful ITA to equate to 2.23 people average, okay? That's how you come to those numbers. I'm just giving you this explanation because so many people have these confusion as to how do you come to these numbers. This is how I come to these numbers. I mean, I'm not, it's not figment of my imagination. I'm not just dreaming of these numbers. I do not wake up and say, okay, let me go with 2.23. No, it's completely on the IRCC website, the open data source. You, you calculate how many people have come to Canada through different streams, how many actually arrived in Canada in that particular year, how many ITAs were issued, uh, how many were declined, refused, rejected, and then you calculate that that's when you come to a number 2.23 is the number that i have that i use for these calculations and this is the background therefore please understand that the number of ita is not the same as the annual pr quota pr quota is for the number of people number of ITAs is different and for this year 2023 the quotas have already been done and finished you will see by the by the time we come to december you will see ircc announcing that we are almost touching half a million people who will be coming to Canada, who have already arrived in Canada as permanent residents. Therefore, if we now come to the understanding or how many people are to be invited this year, nobody knows, right? I, I do not have that number uh, because I do not have a live count of what is happening. But what's happening with Express Entry, right? And that is another thing that a lot of people are wondering why the draws have not been conducted. The last draw which was which was conducted by IRCC for Express Entry was on the 15th of August. 4,300 invitations were issued. 496 was the CRS score that obviously uh, allowed a lot of people the luxury of, of being hopeful that the scores are going to drop further. 490s would be happening. 480s could be happening, etc. However, IRCC played a different role of dice and therefore now you are sitting at a point where IRCC hasn't even conducted a draw. Now, I, I have a couple of theories to this. One, they are rethinking what they're planning to do with this. That's the first thing. Number two, we are expecting Sean Fraser. No, sorry, I keep saying Sean Fraser. Cross, Sean, Sean Fraser, go ahead. Mark Miller. Uh, we are expecting Mark Miller to receive a new mandate letter from Justin Trudeau. 
okay uh, now mandate letters are given to the to the ministers of different or more important or major uh, ministerial portfolios so that they are directed as to what they what they are required to do within their term uh, sean fraser had a had a mandate letter which to be very honest on most counts they did uh, achieve their target uh, or rather they achieved their mandate now mark miller is due to get his mandate letter also uh, next month end of next month october 31st or by 1st of november we are expected to receive the new immigration quotas for the year 2024 and 2026 the, the three-year multi-level plan uh, i have a feeling there is some rethinking going on number one number two the system glitches continue but i don't think it is the system glitches which is which is holding back the draws uh, i have a I have a feeling that this is being done one because mark miller became the minister of immigration the draws continued it did not allow a lot of time for the new minister to come and make any changes any uh, policy decisions anything at all because the the draws were still happening sean fraser changed mark miller came through uh, also i have a feeling that there is a rethink of how many how many uh, invitations they need to issue for different categories now we already know stem category draw only one draw happened which was ridiculous only 500 invitations i can't understand how because they plan to invite about 31 percent of total invitations not category based invitations total total invitations so when i'm saying total invitations means if in the whole year they have issued 77,000 invitations out of the 77,000 invitations they are expecting 31,000 of these invitations have probably gone out to the stem category uh, those 31 could be through the PNPs, could be through the express entry, regular draws, or of course the STEM category based draws. I have, as I said, I have a feeling there is a rethink of how many invitations have already been issued for several se se different categories and how many they are still required to issue. Uh, obviously, the transport category, the agriculture category, these draws haven't happened. Uh, we, are, we are waiting to see these draws as well. Uh, now, Within the skilled trade, do we expect another draw? French, do we expect another draw? Healthcare, do we expect another draw? Uh, and of course, STEM, do we expect another draw? Before these draws to happen, I am expecting that they would conduct the transport and the agriculture draw, and then probably come back to the other category draws if they have to or not. But we are coming pretty close to the end of the year now. We are already in the fourth quarter. And based on this, uh, at this point of time, I was expecting a big regular draw, which happened, 4,300 invitations issued. Going forward from here until the end of December, I don't see much happening for the regular express entry. At least I don't expect anything happening because they still haven't cleared out the category-based draws, at least not for transport and agriculture. They will come back at some point of time to the healthcare because the expectation was about 4,500 to be invited uh for the healthcare uh french i am not sure because they have actually conducted a lot of french category draws so that may may not happen but definitely i'm definitely expecting a stem category draw to be conducted again cannot say when overall there is no way to speculate when the draw will happen i have a very strong feeling that we should see a draw next week uh, it's a feeling it's not coming out of any intelligent uh draw of data just a feeling pure intuition that we will be in the fourth week of the draw not happening and it's just a feeling that there would possibly be a draw four weeks is a good enough time for them to have gotten their heads figured out about whatever they were trying to figure out so hopefully that should see uh, the draw coming back and, and we will have a better understanding of what the pool breakdown is looking like if at all the regular express entry draws are to happen now uh, the scores are definitely above 500 uh, obviously, there are a lot of people who have received their nominations. So the express entry draw has to happen, right? Because uh, IRCC has an obligation to conduct the provincial nominee program draws at least. So the PNP draws have also not happened. So this three-week hiatus sort of doesn't, doesn't really give any clarity as to what's happening. Uh, so definitely, I expect a draw next week. If nothing else, at least a PNP draw, because one month will be a way too much for them to keep holding back on the draws, especially if not conducting a PNP draw. Uh, but apart from that, I do expect a PNP draw. I do expect a category-based draw. And with the PNP draw, just like what they have done earlier, they conducted, for example, if there were 2,000 people in the, with the nomination, they invited 3,000 people or they invited 2,500 people. I expect something similar to start with, probably Tuesday. Let's see how Tuesday brings out. And from there on, probably a Wednesday, Thursday with a category-based draw. Fingers crossed. 
I stay forever hopeful. Let's see how that gets played out. Uh, okay, update to the parents and grandparents program. This was another interesting one. Now, you know, I mean, as much as I and so many of people like me who are in this occupation and profession, we talk about immigration and the matters and, and sometimes we even feel that we have an insight. We don't. Uh, this one was another one which at least I got foxed in this one. Uh, so what happened is in the year 2020, which was the COVID year, uh, they invited parents and grandparents and they just like what they've been doing in the previous years, uh, they invited that anybody who was eligible for a parent grandparent sponsorship, they should get into the pool uh, with an expression of interest. They, co they complete a small questionnaire, they get into the pool and once people got into the pool, they would conduct a draw, they would invite 10, 15, 20,000 people who would then be sent out invitations and therefore those people can then submit an application to sponsor their parents for permanent residence. This has been happening for, for quite a few years already. But what happened after that was, so the people who got into the pool in 2020, same pool or same people who were in the pool were invited again. It's not the same people, but so for example, in the year 2020, 100,000 people got into the pool. Actually, that is the number, 135,000. Some, some, that was a big number that people were in the pool. So out of 135,000 people, in the pool, they invited about 10 to 15,000 in 2020. Uh, ideally, what should have happened in 2021 is that they should have invited a new set of people to come into the pool, but they used the same pool, the same number of people who were already there. So they invited again from the same pool in 2021. In 2022, we expected now at least they have done it for two years. For 2022, at least they will now invite a new set of people, but they didn't. In 2022, again, they took from the same pool and invited again from the same pool. Uh, for this year, we were absolutely sure. Now, this year, it's been three years already. They would invite people fresh. But no, <laughs> IRCC foxed us all. And third year running, now IRCC is taking people from the same pool. Uh, and they haven't invited anybody new. So what they're going to do is, let's talk about this a bit. So IRCC has just announced an update to the parents and grandparents program. They will use the same pool that was created in 2020. No new applicants, no new expressions of interest, no new uh, people who are eligible to invite their parents and they will target to accept 15,000 complete applications. However, in order to get 15,000 complete applications, this also tells you how many people make a mistake and make a mess out of their applications and do not submit, sub submit a complete application. IRCC already knows that. They will actually be sending out 24,200 invitations. IRCC already knows that, that they will send out 24,200 invitations. People will make a mess of it. And only 15,000 complete applications is what they are looking to get so that they can then achieve the target of 25,000 people under the quota for this year of 2023 as permanent residents. So this is what they're looking to invite and get it done with. Uh, Due to the number of forms that are remaining in the pool of submissions from 2020, they are still con con they continue to invite those people. And what else is there? So if you are one of those people, so this is this is a very welcome move for people who had created their profiles or who had gotten to the pool in 2020, right? But for everybody else, this sucks. This is this is really a, a downer because after 2020, a lot of people 2021, 2022, 2023, a lot of people have been eligible with their income. They have been making sure that their eligible income is up to that number so that they can bring their parents. I mean, everybody wants to have their parents in Canada as permanent residents, not just as visitors. So therefore, this this really demotivates and discourages. And I'm sure they're quite frustrated and angry about it. But for people who are from 2020, well, it's a great move. Only be careful, only be smart, only be sure that you submit a complete application once you have received an ITA. Uh, to receive your ITA, please check once they start sending out the ITAs. They will start sending the ITAs in October. From October 10th, they will start sending out the ITAs. And to receive the ITAs or to ensure that you receive the ITA, please check your spam folders. A lot of people lose the ITAs in the spam folders and don't realize that it's, it's there already. Uh, okay, what are the rest of the developments for Canadian immigration for 2023? Prime Minister Justin Trudeau may issue a new ministerial mandate letter in the coming months. Mandate letters are basically instruction letters to the minister so that they have a direction as to what they are supposed to do with their ministry. In the non-election years, IRCC is legally required to release its immigration level plan by 1st of November. So that's what we are expecting. Uh, it is not known if IRCC will decrease, increase or maintain the targets for 2024 to 2026. Minister Mark Miller has said that he doesn't see the targets decreasing. So I'm expecting the numbers to remain same 
or probably increased by three to four percent at most. Uh, Mark Miller is a new minister, so there is a high possibility that there might not be any increase at all in the new numbers. But I'm expecting about three to four percent. Let's see how that plays out. Uh, all eyes on first of November. <laughs> you know what? Canada has been ranked as the second best country in the world. This this obviously triggered a huge truckload of emotions from different people. According to the US news, uh, Canada is the second best in the world as a country behind Switzerland. Now, obviously, Switzerland is a beautiful place to be. They have the, uh, the lakes, they have the mountains, they have the beautiful landscapes. But after Switzerland, Canada apparently is the second best country to be in. Sweden, Australia and the United States rounded up the top five overall countries. United States. Uh, okay. The, the move up to second is an improvement from 2022 when Canada was ranked third uh, overall by the US News. Now, what is the methodology to rank the 87 countries that are there on this list? Uh, IRC is, I'm IRC. US News has surveyed only 17,000 people. Now, imagine only 17,000 people from 36 countries were surveyed. And based on this, they have come up with the, uh, the list of countries of which Number one is Switzerland. Number two is Canada, Australia, and what else was there? US, and I missed one. Uh, da, 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 Sweden. Sweden, Australia, and United. So number three is Sweden, number four is Australia, and number five is the US. Now, apparently, Canada is also the second best country to start a career. Now, talk about all those, talk to all those people who have been coming to Canada as newcomers, can't find a job, and then get frustrated, and then they're complaining, and then at some point of time say that they want to leave. Uh, there is, it is also the fourth best country for education. Uh, it is the seventh best country for studying abroad. Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, look at all the international students. It's the seventh best country for raising kids. It's the second best country for racial equality. Sixth best country for women. Sixth best country for comfortable retirement. I guess it should be number one for that. But yeah, anyways. Sixth most transparent country. And it's the second best country to headquarter a corporation. Talk about a very, very corrupt and a bribed country. I mean, there is a lot of talks about that, but that's for a different day. But there you go. These, these, these are the survey reports. And that tells you how, how much loved Canada is in, in those regards. Uh, I choose not to agree or disagree with any of these uh, survey reports, but this is from US News and I'm not US News. Uh, okay. <laughs> Canada is also ranked as the most attractive destination for immigrant entrepreneurs in 2023. I mean, would you believe it? Uh, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, not OCD, uh, Canada was ranked the most attractive country for the immigrant startup founders and entrepreneurs compared to all other countries. Obviously, only Canada has a startup visa, right? I mean, startup visa is such an easy program. You just spend some money. You get an incubator, you create an idea, float it, and voila, you can come to Canada on a startup visa. There are 24 OECD countries, including the US, France, UK, Sweden, Australia. The OECD was found, has found that Canada scored among the top 25% across all dimensions of the framework, except for skills environment. Canada, together with Australia, is the only country that offers permanent residence to all successful startup visa applicants from day one it offers so you don't have to first create a startup make sure it's successful make sure it's running and then you apply for pr no you apply for pr while applying for your startup is it amazing right so there you go that's where what that's what canada is well that's what i have for you for my presentation connect with us on social media platforms instagram facebook twitter tiktok youtube threads etc etc that's where we are at this point of time if you're still here boop on that like button subscribe to the channel because this is the most rocking place to be if you are interested in canadian immigration and if you're thinking uh, about living in canada studying in canada uh, immigrating to canada visiting canada then ask kubair should be on top of your minds don't you think so right uh, let's get with some questions my back is straining a bit i think i can manage a few more minutes till we get to these questions Okay, <clears throat> FSW Outland EE, four packs, all four category, all four cat in tracker completed August 12th in country A, but early October wedding in country B, returned to A, mid-October we moved to C. 
I honestly don't even understand the question. I just understand the last one. What should we do for PP if requested? Anything to note? Well, from what I'm understanding, you're asking me that if you receive your passport request and you are not in the country where you submitted your application from or your home country or your, your habitual country of residence, then what you should do? Well, what you can do is if you're going to stay put in whichever country you are in when you receive your passport request, then you can raise a web form. You can request IRCC that you are now in this country. And can you please submit your passport uh, to the embassy in that country? Also copy the embassy. Always that's, that's a good idea to do that. Uh, in most cases, you should receive a positive response. If you don't receive a response by the second or the third week, then go ahead and take a copy of your email or the web form that you have raised and your passport request and submit to the nearest visa application center in whichever country you are. Okay. Congratulations in advance. Uh, nothing there. Sorry, Chetan. Ram says, my CIS score is around 438 to 445. I come under federal skilled software engineer. What are my chances? Well, to check your chances, you will have to go online, check on the PNP, check at the past trends, see where your occupation is in demand, and then apply accordingly. I'm sorry, but I cannot really give you the answer as to what. There are so many things to check. You have to check uh, what the which PNPs you might be eligible. But to be very honest, 438 to 445 right now looks quite quite uh, not very encouraging. Uh, if at all STEM category draws conduct to happen, I mean, uh, continue to happen. Uh, then the Ontario's uh, human capital priority stream for tech draw may drop, may, I don't know, I'm saying may, uh, but you should not hold on to the score. You should try and improve your score as much as possible. That's the good, that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, when do we expect the category-based draw for agriculture and agri-food? I don't know the date, but I'm hoping and, and expecting that it should happen soon. Let's see how soon that happens. Do bilingual candidates stand a better chance under express entry? Will IRCC continue the Franco francophone immigration for long? Okay, good question. Yes, uh, bilingual candidates stand a better chance. And the reason they stand a better chance is one, because you get extra points. Okay, So you have English as your first language, you have French as your second language or vice versa. And depending on your uh, skill level in the language, you get more points. And if you can score CLB level seven in French, then you are also eligible under the Frank in the French proficiency category. And will IRCC continue the Francophone immigration? Yes, they will. Why? Because French is the second language of Canada. It's it is official second official language of Canada. And there has been a, a, a political push to increase the Francophone immigration outside Quebec. Uh, the, I guess the number is about at 14% this year that they wish to get to. So this number will continue to grow and I do not see Francophone immigration coming to stop or coming down or decreasing at any point of time anywhere in the foreseeable future. So if you're thinking French, then absolutely do. It is almost, I wouldn't say the word guaranteed, but it is almost has an extremely high chances for success if you are looking to immigrate to Canada. My postgraduate work permit expires in October. I missed the work permit extension, opt-in option. I have applied for PR in May, but I haven't heard back. Should I apply for bridge open work permit or work permit extension? In my opinion, you should apply for the work permit extension. If you are eligible, you should apply for the public policy first. And the reason for that is, God forbid, if your PR application gets refused, then your bridge open work permit may also get refused. Therefore, by the time that happens, we might be in January and then you will not even have an option to apply for the PGWP extension either. But by going in this way, you are now covering up both your bases. That way you will have the work permit authorization. Therefore, you can continue working. And at the same point of time, you would have created some backup. God forbid, in any case, your PR application sees a negative. What are the essential documents to avoid 179B while applying visit? The most important would be to show your strong ties to your home country and that you will indeed return back from Canada to your country. So strong ties is the most important document. I mean, whatever you can establish to prove strong ties. Do I need to mention my current employed last month job in Ontario's application? If I am not claiming points for them in EE, if I do, what documents do I need to provide if I can't submit reference letter? Okay, good question. A lot of people are quite confused with this. Uh, this is how you are supposed to look at it. In Ontario, they are simply asking you to list down and disclose all work, paid work experiences within the last 10 years. 
So you list everything down, regardless of current, past, claiming points, not claiming points. It doesn't matter. List all the work experiences within the last 10 years for your Ontario's application. Now, when it comes to uploading the documents, upload documentation as much as you have, whatever you have for all periods of work. And for any period of work that you're claiming points, make sure you upload complete documentation. And for the remainder in the other document section, upload a letter of explanation stating this period of work, this period of work, this period of work, I do not have documents. I'm not claiming points for them. This is the only period of work I'm claiming points for. And hence I have provided the complete documentation. That is how you should go about. Uh, it doesn't matter what you have shown in Express Entry. For Ontario, you must maintain this. And of course, it should be consistent with your resume. In Express Entry, under the employment history, you will mention only that period of work. Or under your work history, you will mention only those periods of work that you are claiming points for. All other periods of employment, all other periods of work, or all other periods of activity will go under your personal history for the last 10 years. Okay? Can Francophone mobility program be used to migrate myself, wife and child? Yes, you can do that. Uh, it's a great program. As of right now, even with the CLB5, if you find a job offer from an employer, uh, you can uh, get yourself a work permit to come to Canada under the Francophone mobility program. You don't even need an LMI. You just need to find an employer who's willing to offer you a job and pay the employer compliance fee. Then you apply, you prove your uh, French sp uh, speak your French language ability. Once you come to Canada, using the job offer after you complete one year of work experience with that employer, using the job offer, you can also claim those job offer points and therefore getting additional points and getting Canadian work experience points. That should give you an opportunity to get your neck in within the express entry, probably have a higher score and move from there on. Uh, will Francophone Invitations continue in similar fashion? I do not know. I do not know if they will continue with the French proficiency category, but Francophones will always have an advantage. That is for sure. Uh, okay. Do I need to mention my current... Oh, we just did this, right? The processing time for my Saskatchewan application submitted on 3rd of July initially estimated 17 weeks, later changed to 23 weeks, wondering if I might take more than 23 weeks. Well, as far as Saskatchewan is concerned, they are, the processing times are quite long and can vary. Uh, getting your application processed in five to eight months is quite an average normal. In most cases, you might even see a year uh, that might take for processing. Hopefully yours would get processed sooner. Okay, I have forgotten my email user ID password for my Saskatchewan login, but I have a photo of my EOI number. Is there any way to recover my username and password? It's quite difficult if you do not know that basic information. However, you can write to Saskatchewan PNP office and hopefully they would be able to help you out. From your experience, what are the time duration to get Saskatchewan JAL and letter of support? Saskatchewan JAL at this point of time is taking about five to six months. Uh, if it's an open gel, open basically means a no candidate has been specified. But if a candidate has been specified for that position for gel here means job approval letter. Uh, and then in that case, you might get it processed between three to four months. My friend applied for Ontario's human capital priority CEC for healthcare. She got ADR in July and updated. After that, there is no update. It has been more than 100 plus days. What should we do in this situation? Well, you can apply for uh, what what is not clear over here is that is this the nomination process or is this the PR application process? If it is a nomination process, there is nothing you can do except waiting. You can write to Ontario requesting for an update of your application. And if this is a PR application, you can then apply for the GCMS notes. You can raise a web form and you can call IRCC. All of this to understand what's going on. Uh, can you explain what's going on with Saskatchewan? I cannot because I don't know what's going on with this Saskatchewan. They have been conducting draws, not as frequently. The last one that they conducted was a country specific draw, uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, they will come back to their regular draws soon. Uh, got my COPR, book my travel for February. Your channel has been helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, well, great Sahil. Uh, I wish you all the very best. Safe travels, my friend, congratulations. If an unexplainable lump sum was deposited into my account seven months ago and it doesn't reflect in my six month statement, can I use the statement for EE proof of funds? Yes, you can because you will be providing only the last six month statement. What IRCC doesn't see, they don't care. Okay, so yes, you can use that. Don't worry about it. 
Uh, reference letter is extend to three pages as I held three different positions. Do I need to get all the pages signed or the last one? Well, as long as the document is authentic, it is issued by your company. You only need to get the last page signed because that is how a regular document would be signed. So yeah, nothing special to be done in such cases because it is three document, three pages. Uh, what will I do, sir, if your open work permit application already beyond processing time? Well, as I said, you can call IRCC, you can raise a web form. And apart from that, uh, probably practice yoga, meditation and have a bit of patience because I know it can be very frustrating and quite exacerbating to sort of you know, wait and not having an answer. But I, I, feel, I feel you absolutely on this one. But uh, yeah, you'll have to wait to see what happens. How long a person can stay in Canada on an LMIA exempt closed work permit until the validity of your status on that is as mentioned on your work permit until the date on that you can stay in Canada. After that, you can change your status to a visitor. You can apply for extension or you can leave Canada. There were talks about CRS point distribution changes by the end of 2023. Can you give any news about it if you have any? No, there has been no update or news on the changes on the CRS points distribution at this point of time. Uh, that was in talks last year when IRCC came up with a document which was for five pillars uh, of immigration pathways. There has been no further talk. There has been no further insight. We'll have to wait and watch. Uh, a birth certificate is, is birth certificate required for express entry or PNP? For express entry, a birth certificate is not required for an adult. For PNP, some PNPs, they do require it. For example, Saskatchewan requires it. So it requires it. Uh, Ontario does not require it. So you can always follow the document checklist to tell you to see where it is required. Can you tell the reason for the delay in express entry draws? I think we discussed that in detail, right? I'm going for Ontario in-demand skill stream. Is there anyone who can help me on this one? You have several, I have several questions regarding this stream. Well, the best thing to do would be to check the Ontario's website. It does have very detailed explanation of most of the questions you might have. If you still don't have the answer, then you can always come back and post your questions on our social media platforms. Hopefully somebody who understands will be able to help you with that, with their experience. Uh, Maple View Super Sticker, thank you so much. Received AOR on the 17th of August. How can I know the current status of my application? The tracker portal is showing my client ID as not requested. You received on 17th, AOR was on 17th of August. It's, we're only on the 9th of September. And don't you think you're in a, a super duper rush to sort of check what the status is? At this point of time, there is probably no status because your application may have not even cleared the R10 completeness check. Wait for that to happen. Once your medicals have been passed, then you will be able to cre create your tracker uh, on the portal. Uh, other than that, you can always order the GCMS note. Please see my question below in normal chat. Well, I, I can't at this point of time. There is too many questions. Sorry about that. My primary knock code is, however, is the 60010. However, the code in my nomination is 11202. Will IRCC reject my file because I have used two different knock codes? Uh, no, your primary knock code need not be the same as your nominated knock code as long you as long as you also have work experience in the nominated knock code and that justifies under which you received your nomination. So that's not a problem at all. Uh, after COPR and before landing in Canada, can an applicant in India start a business in India in a knock different from the NOC in PR application, should we notify IRCC? Good question. Uh, no, you don't need to. Forget about uh, after receiving COPR, even after submitting your express entry application. If there is any change in your business, if there is any change in your employment, if there is any change in your uh, uh, promotion, employment, whatever that might be, if you are a federal skilled worker, you're outside Canada, you do not need to inform IRCC. Whether you're doing a business, you're not doing a business, you're working, you're not working, you're resigning, you're getting promoted, you're leaving, you're changing jobs. None of this needs to be communicated to IRCC. IRCC is giving you your COPR or your application is being assessed based on your past work experience. They have got nothing to do with what you're planning to do or looking to do or changing in terms of your employment at this point of time or even later. Right, last few questions before I will scoot off. 
Yeah, the back's beginning to strain a bit. <sighs> Will maternity leave be counted for CEC? No, maternity leave is not counted for CEC. You're not working. Even if you're getting paid, you're not working. So imagine uh, you join a company. After six months, you go for a maternity leave and you're on leave for six months. Can you count this as one year of work experience? No, you cannot. I mean, you only work for six months, regardless of the fact that you might have even been paid. Uh, you cannot count it, unfortunately. Working with an MNC since May 2022 under an open work permit. Now the conditions of my work permit change to closed work permit under the LMI exempt category approved 1st of August. Can I get 50 points for job offer? No, you cannot. You have to work for one year on a closed work permit in order to claim points for the job offer. For Ontario, do we need to have specific NOC code for applying an employer job offer worker stream or only documents from employer will be enough? The employer is willing to support. Uh, okay, so I'm not really sure about your question, but let me try and decipher this. Uh, you have to have a job offer in a specific NOC code. I mean, it has to be. It has to be based on a specific occupation. And you, on the same occupation, you have to have at least two years of work experience to be eligible under the employer job offer stream in Ontario. Okay. Uh, so if your NOC does not match, what will happen is when, I ask, when Ontario conducts the employer job offer stream draws, they are selecting certain, certain occupations. So if you have not received a, a job offer in that occupation, then you will not be invited. I, I hope that helps. So yes. The knock need not be written on your job offer, but it has to match with the specific knock code based on which you will get invited. Is it okay to leave fields such as middle name and declaration parts for spouse empty? Uh, so in declaration field, you have to write your spouse's name, but the middle name, if your spouse doesn't have a middle name, then obviously you can leave it as empty, no problem. Uh, I applied for super visa for my mother. It was evaluated as super visa category, but when I got the visa stamp, it was PG one. It wasn't PG one, but, but, but V one. Can I request for a recheck and correction? Uh, if it has been approved as V one, it basically means it has been approved as a visitor, not as a super visa application. I'm not sure why it was not approved as a super visa application. You can always raise a, a request for reconsideration. Yes. And you can also apply for the GCMS notes to understand why it was not. Sometimes maybe IRCC is not convinced about your uh, employment and that you meet the income threshold. Then in that case, sometimes they will not approve the super visa, but they will approve the visit visa. But the best answer will come to you only from IRCC. I sent one of my Canadian education credentials two weeks after submitting my Ontario application. They emailed me and they said, receive my doc. My application is in submitted stage. Will they return my application? I don't understand your question. I mean, uh, why did you send your education credentials two weeks later? Why did you not submit it with your application in the first place? That's the first issue. Secondly, did that credential create a sort of, was it for points? Was it for uh, the minimum requirement, depending on which stream you applied for? That will also define whether that requirement of credential was important or not. And now that you've already submitted, I guess the only thing to do is to wait. Hopefully they will accept it. In most cases, if they have received the document before they have started, uh, processing your application, then they should usually proceed with the documents uh, as considered as you having submitted the first time. So I would hopefully expect that they would continue with your application and, and process it as received completely. Okay. Uh, all right, did this, did this, did this. Okay, last two questions before I go, okay. Uh, I got portal one email for my CEC application. My dependent spouse is non-accompanying. Do I need to send the details of her when responding to the portal email? No, you don't need to. You're, first of all, there is no such thing as portal one, portal two. I don't know who creates these nomenclatures and why do they do this? It confuses the heck out of different people. So you have received an approval email for your PR application asking you to confirm whether you're inside Canada. If your spouse was not a, not accompanying and is not with you in Canada, there is no need to include your spouse's details. You will simply just include your details. If you wish to, you can also add about your spouse, but you will say your spouse was not accompanying. Okay. 
लास्ट क्वेश्चन वॉट इफ सम वन ऑन पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट वर्क परमिट गॉट अ पी आर सपोर्टिंग एल एम आई ए वेन डज वन स्टार्ट वर्किंग फॉर अ न्यू एम्प्लॉयर इफ इट इज अ पी आर सपोर्टिंग एल एम आई ए यू विल गेट द पॉइंट फॉर योर पी आर एप्लीकेशन थ्रू दी एल एम आई ए एंड द जॉब ऑफर नाउ आफ्टर यू बिकम अ पी आर इफ यू विश टू वर्क इट्स अप टू यू इफ यू डोट विश टू वर्क यूर एन ओपन वर्क परमिट यू वॉन्ट टू वर्क फॉर द एम्प्लॉयर यू वर्क सो देर इज नो कंडीशन देर इज नो रिक्वायरमेंट अटैच that you have to work for this employer it's a pr supporting lmi right means you've taken the points in your pr application from that date after you've taken the points you work for the employer you don't work for the employer you become a pr then choose to work for the employer the choice is absolutely yours there is no conditions there is no requirements there is no criteria at all uh, my employer pays me cash salary do i require documents to prove that yes you should you should provide pay slips pay stamps cash vouchers or a register where you sign that you are receiving salary or any kind of payment voucher or a salary certificate from the employer which states that they have paid you this salary in cash please provide that cash salary by that by itself is not a problem ircc accepts it there is no problem in having a cash salary the problem is that you should be able to prove that you are being paid because it is cash it becomes a problem therefore get an a letter from your employer additional letter which is a salary certificate where they explicitly state that yes you were working for this period of time this was your job designation this was your title this was your salary and they paid you this salary in cash that should work for you right thank you so much everybody thank you for joining in we will do this of course again as we do more of these uh if you are still here then please do subscribe to the channel and of course like share and and do whatever you need to do with the video thank you so much i shall see you next time